welcome to Czech Conference. I'm Hartmut from Czech TV, and I'm here with Nigel Hahnemann from Cloudbase. Hi. Hi. Hi, Nigel. Could you introduce yourself uh, at first? Sure, I'm Nigel Hahnemann, and uh, I've come from a development background. I've done a lot of development, working my way up to solutions architecture. Uh, and the last few years, I've been really working in the infrastructure space as well, um, doing some DevOps work, done a build engineer role. Um, so really, I've covered a big spectrum of, of, of roles. Mm -hmm. Uh, and your role at CloudBees? Yeah, so I joined CloudBees recently as a senior solutions architect, um, and my role there is to work with our customers uh, across various levels from CTO and across to operations and engineering to understand how they're trying to do continuous integration and continuous delivery, uh, and how you know, Jenkins can support them in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to talk about Jenkins. Uh, so CloudBees is the uh, enterprise Jenkins company, no, right? Correct. And uh, Jenkins just has hit, uh, I think, 100,000 uh, active installations. Yes, right? that's quite correct. impressive. Mm -hmm. To what do you attri attribute this, this growth? Yeah, so it's really great to be part of such a, an active and vibrant open source community. Um, you know, our committers are really active and building plugins for uh, all sorts of environments. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've seen such a huge amount of growth. Um, you know, Jenkins really can be used across the spectrum of the technologies that our uh, customers uh, want to use it. Mm -hmm. Do you see any trends how Jenkins users or also CloudBees customers are using Jenkins? Yes, I mean, I think there's uh, three, uh, three things that come to mind there. Um, the first is that, like in the application space, uh, customers have been using Jenkins to support continuous integration. We're now seeing people that are looking at automating their infrastructure, applying the same sort of continuous integration pipeline uh, to their uh, infrastructure builds. So where they're using tools like Puppet and Chef and Ansible, um, you know, you've now got tools that allow you to test those things. So, I suppose uh, Lint and Puppet Aspec and um, uh, Test Kitchen come to mind. Uh, and so people want to test their infrastructure before they say it's ready. Um, and we're really seeing Jenkins being used to uh, deliver CI loops uh, on top of that sort of uh, test cycle. Um, that's kind of the first area. Um, the second area that I think we're seeing is people moving from uh, continuous integration pipelines to continuous delivery. Uh, so they're broadening what they're automating. And again, um, Jenkins is a natural tool for that because we've got so many plugins that support so many technologies um, that they're able to automate their deployments to the likes of you know, um, uh, Tomcat and uh, Jetty, but also onto the more modern technologies, you know, the container-based technologies. Um, and Jenkins fits that, so we're seeing a bigger uptake because of that. Um, and I think the, you know, the third reason that we're seeing the uptake is that we've got such a big open source community. Um, you know, the number of plugins. If you want to deploy to something that isn't supported, you can build it. Um, if the market hasn't already built it for you, you can roll your sleeves up and code it yourself. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the uh, continuous delivery DevOps several times. Um, what issues do organizations uh, face typically when they try to implement yeah. continuous delivery practices? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question because, I mean, my background is, you know, I've done this in real companies for a number of years and it can be quite tough. Um, one of the big things is how you enable the right culture. Uh, I mean, in my view, DevOps isn't a thing, it's not a team. Um, it's really about a culture of developers and operations working together collaboratively um, to try and improve the situation. Um, and I think you have, to, you have to align those teams, you have to give them the same goals. Um, if they're in different reporting silos with different objectives, it's really, really hard to get them to work together. Um, but if they're focused on achieving high quality, frequent delivery, um, you can let them evolve and, and they'll improve the technologies and the implementation that they have uh, and really foster that kind of can-do DevOps culture that we, we want to see. Um, the second thing, I think, is you have to consider the wider organizational impact. Uh, you know, if you move towards DevOps and, and frequent release cycles, um, that's great. If your dev team wants to deploy weekly, that, that's really great. You know, you get feature and value to market quicker. Um, but sometimes the wider organization can't handle that. It's a change. Uh, you know, what if you have to write documentation and publish it? Uh, can you keep up with that speed? Um, and I've also worked in companies where the change management guys, you know, they're following ITIL processes and you have to take your release to the change board. And 
their cycle time is two weeks. Well, you know, how do you resolve that with a one week release cycle? Um, and there's te tips and techniques that you can do to work around that, but you need to get big buy-in from across the teams. Um, and management sometimes need to work you know, outside of their direct developer team and, and help engage the wider organization to make, make it successful. And I think the sort of third area in that is you need the tooling. Um, you know, you, you need to invest the time to pick the right tools that enable collaboration. Uh, you know, devs and ops have typically come from different domains, they use different tools. Um, you don't want a separate ticketing platform. You know, you want them to share tickets, file the same defects, look at the same source code, share the configuration. If, they, if they're working in silos, it's really, really hard to foster that culture. And then finally, I think you need to address the areas around reliability and security. Um, you know, devs and ops, again, it's different backgrounds. Ops are looking at making sure the production platform is stable and it's secure and only authorized changes are being made. Um, and developers are used to being able to commit code whenever they've made the change and you know, having automated tools run it. And you need to address those concerns um, and part of that is making sure that the, the platform you put in place, you know, everyone's comfortable with its reliability and uh, its, its security. Uh, and of course that's where um, you know, the choice of tooling becomes quite, quite important. Mm -hmm. Do you have an advice for organizations who want to, to, to implement the DevOps culture? Continuous delivery pipeline. Yes, and I think again, drawing on my experience, uh, you know, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, I prefer to use the phrase, "You can't eat the elephant all at once." Um, and my advice would be, start small, um, little and often. Um, I also use the phrase, "The low-hanging fruit," I and mean, it kind of gets overused. But look at the things that are time-consuming today. Look at the things that are manual, um, and start automating those first. And as you take those manual tasks off the table, you'll improve the quality and you'll free up your resource to work on the next best thing. Uh, and slowly work through uh, all the areas that you need to automate until you've covered it all off. Um, and again, coming back to the tooling, I would recommend that you pick uh, extensible tooling, open and extensible tooling. From my experience, there is no such thing as partial automation. You know, if you're going to do continuous delivery, if you want to have a DevOps culture, um, you need to cover all the technologies that your application requires to get into production. So be that reconfiguring firewalls, cutting over load balancers, um, you need to have a tool set that will enable you to do that. Uh, and if you, if you choose open source, then you can extend it as new technologies come along. Mm. You mentioned open source, so um, CloudBee is an enterprise Jenkins company. What's the difference between your uh, Jenkins offering and the open source Jenkins? Again, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, CloudBees is there really to support the adoption of, of Jenkins for business critical applications. Uh, if you're deploying on a regular basis a mission critical application, you want a nice, robust, reliable, scalable platform. Uh, and our goal is to help address those concerns for, for the larger customers, for the enterprise customers. Um, and we do that through a couple of ways, really. We make sure that our Jenkins release is based on a long-term support release from the community. Uh, we make sure that it is stable. Um, and then we back that up through our professional support team. Um, our engineers and our support uh, team between them have probably contributed around 80% of the Jenkins core code uh, and code to many, many of the plugins. So our support guys are, are there, you know, they can be there 24-7. Uh, we're around the, the globe with various locations. Uh, you know, we can offer that to our enterprise customers. So if they have a, a, a site problem with their build and CD and CI environment, we can help them get back up and running really, really quickly. And then the sort of thing that we've learned from there is, you know, you need extra features. Uh, you need to be able to work at scale. Uh, you need to have things like um, uh, standby nodes for high availability. Uh, you want a better security model. And we have uh, in the enterprise uh, Jenkins by CloudBees, we have these extra plugins that enable the companies to achieve that level of maturity. Mm. Uh. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. And enjoy the text conference. Thank you very much.